Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. There is a very friendly and talkative uh, climate tonight. It's great. That's what we are trying to do to connect uh, people with all the richness that there is around us, and it starts also in this kind of event, in this kind of uh, context. So this is the eighth uh, lecture of the Prism series of this season with uh, Uzrama, who is going to talk about it. Cotton clothes as continuity. Um, she subtitled the uh, talk "The Power of the Handloom." Um, and the the chair will be Dunu Roy. Um, some of you may know that uh, yesterday started in Delhi the Silk Fab exhibition, which is organized by the National Handloom Development Corporation and um, supported by the, the Ministry of Textile and inaugurated by the Minister of Textile, Mr. Gangwar. And the idea apparently was to bring um, artisans and uh, weavers from 16 states of the Union to make them meet um, a larger crowd in Delhi and um, sell their products directly to the, to the consumers. Now, they were also trying to implement this new government scheme of having little tags on the clothes, tags saying handloom mark, silk mark, and to try to um, um, make this business more uh, clean and uh, make the products more trustable for everybody. Now this is the official story, the story of the government and these, the initiatives of the government, but the larger picture is a little bit more complicated. Um, the Indian textile industry is facing today a debt of uh, 2 lakh crore rupees, which is affecting the 60 to 70 lakh employees in this field in the country. And it affects the whole chain, from the farmers, to the genus, the spinners, the tires, and the weavers. And to face this other reality, um, people like Uzrama have been trying to take different types of initiatives. And she is, of course, recognized for the work she has done with the Dust Kar Hamja Trust in the 90s, and later with the Decentralized Cotton Yarn Trust and the Malka Marketing Trust, about which you might have read some information uh, in the entrance. To introduce the discussion tonight, we are having uh, Juno Roy. Thank you for coming. Um, it's very interesting because he was uh, almost late because of the traffic of Diwali. And a few weeks back, uh, as I was taking my 840 bus from Merrily to Ames, I looked on my left from the window uh, around the Hoskas and I saw a car and somebody inside screaming like this at the crowd. And I think that was the right. <laughs> and so this is following you, following us or so. Anyway, he's here, luckily. Um, Dunoy is the director and the founder of the Hazard Center in Delhi. And the Hazard Center uh, is also uh, interestingly uh, connected uh, in minds with LIDA in the sense that it is very original or unique type of center on the farm in what they do and how they work. It is basically a multidisciplinary team that is assisting community and labor organizations uh, as they face their own hazards in their own fields. And they are um, helped by a group of, by a um, resource group of professionals, experts, institutions from around the country uh, to work with uh, marginalized groups in a variety of fields, uh, some of which development policy, planning, sanitation, transportation, uh, water, electricity, governance, livelihoods, etc. And Dunroy, um, at the head of this institution, and also with his previous works, has been a very vibrant and energetic voice for several decades, many decades. Really? Many decades, and um, and uh, I hope and I'm rather sure, in fact, and confident that this energy 
will be there tonight also, as he introduces with Rama for tonight's talk, Quran Clothes as Continuity, The Power of the Hand. Thank you.
but into the hands of the millions of cotton farmers who grew the cotton, the women who spun the yarn, and the weavers who wove the cloth. India grew rich from its export, so rich that Europeans flocked to India to make money for themselves, to shake the pagoda tree, as it was said. Today, I'm going to remind you of the many advantages of weaving on the handloom. I want to suggest to you that we should look at the handloom not as an outmoded relic of the past, but as a low carbon production technology for the energy stressed future. In my talk, I'll tell you about the grim reality of cotton yarn spinning in India today, which uh, Sam, I think, was hinting at, and what a dreadful fate awaits it. I will also point out a possible brighter future, a possible, affordable, and rational future in which we safeguard the Indian cotton textile industry and our rural livelihoods. For much of my life, I've been fascinated by the story of cotton and cotton cloth making in India. I've spent the last 24 years working in this field. I'm part of a small group of people who have been puzzling over the strange trajectory of the indigenous cotton textile industry of India during more than 20 years of research combined with active involvement with handlooms. And I find that the reality is as unbelievable as a fairy tale. I'll tell, I'll tell the story of the different bits of this industry by jumping from country to country and century to century, backwards and forwards, because that's the way the story makes sense. In between, we hear some voices from history. And I'll end with a possible roadmap for the future. And I hope you all will have comments to add. Simply put, India today is actively decimating a sensible, energy efficient, low carbon way of weaving cotton cloth on the handloom in favor of capital and energy intensive mechanized weaving, which only survives on subsidized electricity and exploited workers. That's power of weaving. And the yarn spinning industry too is in terrible shape. But it's always the woes of the handloom and the handloom weaver that we're told about, while the much larger woes of mechanized weaving and spinning in India seem to be hidden or ignored. To understand the strength of the handloom, we need also to look into the dismal situation of the mainstream cotton in, in textile industry today. And I'll be doing this as part of the talk. The past, present, and future of cotton cloth making in India are all fascinating. The distant past is extraordinary. The Indian subcontinent clothed the world in cotton cloth for thousands of years. The present is a mess, a real horror story, and perhaps you don't know as much about this as about our glorious past. The future depends on the choices we make. I believe the Indian cotton textile industry has the potential to be a huge factor in India's social and economic well-being if we take the right direction and recognize the power of the handloom. Making cotton cloth was the largest and most important industry of the subcontinent for around 2,000 years, from the time of Jesus Christ up to about the middle of the 19th century. Actually, I think that's a fairly commonly known fact. But do you also know that today, over 50 million people in India grow cotton, gin cotton, bale and unbaled cotton, spin cotton yarn, weave cotton cloth, sell cotton cloth, make clothes from cotton, export cotton yarn or clothes, or make oil and oil cake from cotton seed. And we're not even talking about the tool makers or including Pakistan and Bangladesh. Did you know that? No. That's the unbelievable part. As if by magic, as if it's a fairy tale, this massive industry has become invisible. Questions need to be asked. And the first one is, is how did the vibrant past turn into the grim present? The answer seems obvious. Mechanization in the 19th century made, made craft production unviable. That's what most people believe, but it wasn't as simple as that. There's a crucial point here. The mechanization was not just a matter of turning a hand process into a mechanical one. It was a shift of fundamentals. It was a paradigm shift. 
It changed a flexible technology into a rigid one. It changed a dispersed industry made up of millions of small, scattered production centers into a centralized one, concentrated in industrial areas, where the profits went into only a few pockets. The Tatas, the Ruyas, the Sarabhais, the Ambanis, all made their first millions in textile mills, if you remember. Mechanization need not have been like that. It could have been quite different. You could have had mechanization that was both flexible and decentralized, as the industry had been before. And by the way, the change didn't happen automatically and smoothly, as many of you must be aware. It was made to happen all through the 19th century through unfair trade practices by the English East India Company. A fascinating part of the textile story, and that's my next chapter. Imagine yourself living in India in the year 1820. You will remember from your history books what was going on in India at that time. The last Mughal emperor was weak. The Marathas were defeated. Names familiar to us played prominent roles on the Indian stage. Ranjit Singh of the Punjab, Baji Rao Peshwa of the Marathas, Wajid Ali Shah of Awadh, all of whom wielded enormous power. But the most powerful ruler of them all was the British East India Company. What was the company? It was merely a large corporate entity, like Walmart is today. But backed by the government of Britain, it starts to rule over large parts of India. The company maintains an army, levies taxes, and makes laws. Nick Robbins, in his book, The Corporation That Changed the World, points out, at its height, the company ruled over one-fifth of the world's people, generated a revenue greater than the whole of Britain, and commanded a private army a quarter of a million strong. Can you imagine Walmart having its own army? I mean, they might still, it might still come to that. Levying taxes and making laws. A corporate entity whose sole purpose is actually to make a profit for its shareholders. The trade of the company, the honorable company as it was known, had an effect not just on the economies but also on the societies of both England and India. An effect that is hard to overemphasize as a scholar of the subject puts it. Beginning in the early 1600s, the company imports cotton cloth from India into England where it becomes extremely popular because it is so washable and because the dyes are so fast. People prefer it to the locally woven cloth made from wool, linen, and mixed fibers. So much so that it destroys the English textile industry and ruins the lives of English handloom weavers, while it makes English traders and merchants rich. Remember Napoleon 200 years later called them a nation of shopkeepers. This is a famous picture that caused an uproar. Some people said she's wearing only her night clothes. And uh, other people said that she is patronizing the English traders and neglecting our own French uh, textile industry. Cotton is the hinge on which artisanal cloth making turns to mass production. The first machines of the Industrial Revolution are machines for spinning cotton yarn, if you remember the spinning jenny and the mule and so on. Machines that can be run by water or steam. This new industrial cotton textile production needs to be fed cotton at an industrial rate. So, cotton begins to be grown in the newly colonized American co continent to be imported into <coughs> England from America. Cotton that is grown and picked and ginned by African slaves and the children of those slaves. Indeed, so closely tied were cotton and slavery that the price of a slave directly correlated to the price of cotton, says an article in 2011 in the New York Times, headed when cotton was king. Slave-produced cotton is imported into England to be mechanically turned into cotton yarn, the first product of mass production. And where is all that yarn to be sold? In India, of course, the biggest cotton cloth weaver in the world. The company carries the machine-made cloth 
machine made yarn to India, selling it cheap. This is made from cotton that has come overseas from America, made into yarn in England, and then carried overseas to India. But it is sold cheaper than the locally hand spun yarn. So it destroyed the hand spinning industry of India. So here is the first of two voices from history. A short extract from Representation from a Suffering Spinner, a letter printed in the Bengali newspaper Samachar Darpan in 1828, of course, in translation. I am a spinner, the letter says. After having suffered a great deal, I am writing this letter. The weavers used to visit our houses and buy the chakha yarn at three tolas per rupee. Now, for three years, we two women, her husband has died and only uh, her daughters are married off and only these two women are left. We two women, mother-in-law and I, are in want of food. The weavers do not call at the house for buying yarn. Not only this, if the yarn is sent to market, it is not sold even at one-fourth the old prices. They say that Bilaiti yarn is being largely imported. I heard that its price is three to four rupees per sale. I beat my brow and said, oh God, there are sisters more distressed even than I. I had thought that all men of Bilat were rich, but now I see that there are women who are poorer than I. They have sent the product of so much toil out here because they could not sell it there. But it has brought our ruin only. Men cannot use the cloth out of this yarn even for two months. It rots away. I therefore entreat the spinners over there to judge where it, whether it is fair to send yarn here or not. The devastation of hand spinning was one part of the destruction of the Indian cotton textile industry by the East India Company. There was more. There were the taxes. Listen to Francis Carnac Brown on the subject of taxes in 1862. Francis is a British cotton planter in India on the Malabar coast. The story of cotton in India is not half told, he says, how it was systematically depressed from the date that American cotton came into competition with it, about 1786, how one half of the crop was taken in kind as revenue, the other half by the sovereign merchant at a price much below the market price of the day, how the cotton farmers plow and bullocks were taxed, the charkha taxed, the bow taxed, and the loom taxed, how it paid export duty both in a raw state and in every shape of yarn, of thread, cloth, or handkerchief. How the dyer was taxed and the dyed cloth taxed. How Indian peace goods were loaded in England with a prohibitory duty. And English peace goods were imported into India at a duty of 2.5%. He goes on to say, it is my firm conviction that the same treatment would long since have converted any of the finest countries in Europe into wilderness. That was the 19th century. Now, if you've finished grinding your teeth and wiping your eyes, we'll take a jump backwards in time to the period that lasted from the time of Jesus Christ up to the early 19th century. This was a period almost 2,000 years in which India clothed the world. And the great uh, achievement of that cloth, of that period, as you must have heard, was Dhaka muslin. Cloth woven so fine that it had names like woven wind, evening dew, and flowing water. So fine that when the Mughal emperor Shah Jahan chides his daughter for being immodestly dressed, she retorts that she has on seven layers of the stuff. Yes, of course this was a fantastic achievement. But in my opinion, the greater achievement was something else, which I want you to pay close attention to, because I believe that it is this that holds the key to the future. This is Indian cloth found in Egypt. Carbon dated from the 9th to the 14th century. There's some uh, 1225 little pieces of cotton found preserved in the hot, dry sands of Egypt. It is thick, ordinary, coarse cloth. Ruth Barnes, the textile scholar, says rather disparagingly, these textiles cannot claim fame as good examples of outstanding craftsmanship. But the significance for me is exactly that, that it is coarse cloth, obviously for the common man. India was unique in producing ordinary cotton cloth for ordinary people on a vast scale 
as a market-oriented activity from which millions of people derived their living. Making and selling cotton yarn and cloth were economic activities which gave people an income. What happened uh, otherwise was for the rich people, it was made in karkhanas. And uh, China was the only other country which made cotton cloth on a large scale. But like in our Northeast today, cotton cloth for ordinary people was made by themselves at home as a domestic activity, like cooking. And whereas uh, the Chinese emperor in the 9th century is supposed to have had one cotton robe which he held in high esteem. But according to my understanding, make, making ordinary coarse cloth for arm army was India's real strength. Ordinary cloth made in vast quantities by ordinary weavers for ordinary people at affordable prices. Cotton needs the largest number of processes to turn it from a raw fiber into cotton cloth. And it was because of the structure of Indian society that each of these processes was a specialization of a particular jati. And this is part of what I call the uh, everyday weaving, unlike the Karkhana weaving, which was for the elite. And a lot of this went into the uh, local markets. It was so viable, so embedded in society, that it has stained, sustained for several thousand years. This is not just a matter of historic interest, but it is a vital clue to the future. About scale, enough cotton cloth was made in India to clothe India's own rich and poor and for export, both eastwards and to the west. In the first century after Christ, the Roman historian Pliny is heard complaining that India is draining Rome of her gold. Of course, this was partly also for spices, but mostly for cotton cloth. In 1610, a French navigator, Pirate de Laval, says about Indian cloth, wherewith everyone from the Cape of Good Hope to China, man and woman, is clothed from head to foot. And it was the largest variety of cloth that the world had ever seen up to then. Every, every year, ships arrive from Gujarat on India's west coast. From Cambay, a ship put into port worth 70 to 80,000 cruzados, carrying cloths of 30 different sorts. A cruzado is a gold coin, it's a Portuguese gold coin. So this shipload is worth 80 gold coins. Uh, this is what Tomé Pires says in Malacca in 1515. And you find the names of some of these varieties in that wonderful book, uh, Hobson Jobson, which is an Anglo-Indian dictionary. <coughs> Albeli, Alrofs, Kosai, Baftas, Bejutas, Koras, Dorias, Dosutis, Cheent, Ginghams, Jamdanis, Moris, Manvans, Mushrooms, Nansuks, Nilai, Palampur, Punjam, Susi, and so on and so on. But export was the smaller part. I would say it was between I don't know, 5 to 7% of cotton cloth produced in India. A huge part, the much the larger part of the indigenous cotton textile industry went into the local loops. Cotton grown, spun, woven and sold locally through local markets. I have here an account of a local weekly market from 1867 in which out of about 1400 stores, it's a weekly uh, market, uh, they sell pan, they sell gur, they sell oil, brass, and so on. Out of 1400 stalls, 572 relates to cotton, yarn, and cloth. And out of the cloth sellers, 350 of them are non weaver casts. It says underneath, theirs selling cotton cloth of their own manufacture. Entirely in the hands of the theirs who spin the thread and work the looms. The cloth is coarse and strong and is in great favor among the kunbis of Bihar, hard-working practical men, farmers, to whom the comparatively flimsy but smart-looking English-made cloth does not suit, and who still draw large supplies of this native cloth from Jammu Kattak. That is where the weekly market is held. It's amazing how little research has been done on this part of Indian textile making. All the textile scholarship seems to be about export. No research 
on clothing for the entire Indian population, 250 million people in 1830. That's part of the cloak of invisibility this industry wears. It's not just by historic interest that we need to look into this, but more important to understand what were our particular strengths and advantages. Do we still have those strengths and advantages and can we still use them for the future? Can we use them to make a viable, ecological, and democratic cotton textile industry, not one that just puts more money into rich industrialists' pockets. Now back to the 19th century, and let's see how the intervention of the East India Company affected the growing of cotton in India. Cotton has been grown in India for several thousand years by smallholder farmers. It was always grown like that, it is still grown like that. I think the average holding is uh, between 2 and 2.5 acres. Different varieties were grown in different parts of the country. They were rain-fed and grown mixed with food crops of various lentils. Growing it with other crops did two things. It kept off pests and it replenished the soil. Cotton is a very greedy feeder. These two things made it possible to grow cotton in the same spot over millennia. But different varieties did not suit mass production. And Indian cottons did not suit the new yarn spinning machinery that began to be invented in England in the early 1800s. This new way of spinning yarn was not in the small scattered locations as it had been earlier, using wooden equipment. It was concentrated in a few places and used huge machinery made of rigid steel. And what effect did this change in spinning have on Indian cotton farms and cotton farmer families an earth-shaking effect. Now cotton had to be aggregated, collected together, so that it had to be all of one kind. And that kind of cotton had to be the kind that could stand up to the harsh action of these new steel machines. Indian varieties were too soft and their fibers were too short. And so American cotton varieties were introduced into Indian cotton farms by, of course, the East India Company. It needed long, strong fibers, the new English technology that needed long, strong fibers that could stand the heat and the stress of that spinning. A Colonel Prain, writing in 1828, tells us, I have no doubt that the fine cotton produced near Dhaka is one cause of the superiority of the manufacture, he says. Nor do I think that any American cotton is so fine. But then there can be no doubt that the American kinds have a longer filament and on that account are more fitted for European machinery. The machines were heavy metal, bruising and battering the delicate cotton fibers. Longer, stronger filaments took the strain better, though they didn't produce better cloth. Now that kind of cotton became known as the best cotton not the cotton that made the best cloth. So instead of inventing a technology to suit the cotton, Walmart's ancestor, the East India Company, changed the cotton plant to suit the technology. This was, of course, the time when man was supposed to have any uh, all uh, uh, superiority over nature and could do anything it wanted with nature. And nobody cared that they sees and Americans grow in very different ways one of which is suited to Indian conditions, and one of which emphatically is not. And since then, till today, the definition of the best quality cotton is what can stand up to harsh machine processing. And as machines are made to run faster and faster, uh, this is technical development, nature is expected to keep up. So I have here also a copy of a paper that appeared in Economic and Political Weekly in uh, 1995, uh, Suicide Deaths and the Quality of Indian Cotton, sorry, 1999, which you can look up. But nature has its limits, and that brings us with a bang into the 21st century. Cotton farmers today have only one customer, the spinning mill. And all spinning mills today only have one kind of machinery the kind that demands ever longer and stronger staples. Growing American cottons does not suit Indian soils or Indian climates. Why? Because, as we say down south, 
the American hirsutum cottons are shallow rooted. They cannot stand extremes of climate. And you can never depend on the Indian climate. One year it rains too much, the next year the rains fail. Desis have long tap roots, which helps them survive both too much and too little rain. Hirsutums need irrigation. Irrigation, uh, hirsutums are the American variety. Irrigation creates humidity in which bacterial, viral, fungal diseases and pests thrive, to which cotton is particularly prone. The Bt gene is only useful against a few varieties of caterpillar. It's not a cure for virus or fungus, nor does it prevent insect attack by non-caterpillar insects like thrips and aphids and mites and mealybugs. So that new large-scale spinning broke up the close relation of weaving cotton with growing cotton. After all, weavers and farmers were neighbors then in villages, as they still are. Today, between them stands the modern spinning mill, to whom the cotton farmers must sell their cotton, and from whom the handloom weavers must buy their yarn. A mill that forces farmers to grow the kind of cotton that's immensely risky for them a level of risk that small farmers cannot bear. Farmer suicides that have been happening particularly in Maharashtra and Andhra Pradesh for the last 20 years are evidence of that. They are part of the largest wave of suicides in history. As Sainath reminds us, many, possibly most of these suicides are of cotton farmers. But I don't read anywhere that the connection of cotton farmer suicides with cotton spinning technology has been made Let's take a quick look at how yarn making happens in the mill. <coughs> Cotton lint from the plant is first separated from the seeds, obviously. Now in the 1800s, at this stage, a new process was introduced. After removing the seed, the loose fluffy lint began to be pressed tightly into bales, steam pressed. So tightly that it became as hard as a block of wood and needed an elaborate process and huge machinery to get it back into separate fibers, basically back to its original form. It's only after that that the fibers then go into the pre-spinning and the carding machine and so on. Three stages uh, which make it into yarn. Of course, baling made sense when it was done to carry the cotton overseas to England. That's what it was invented for. But the unbelievable thing is that baling, bale breaking, bale opening, and reconstituting it into individual fibers are still integral parts of yarn making. Because the machinery has been invented to start with bale cotton. So we have cotton growing next door, and we have a spinning mill, but still the baling and unbaling happens. And these additional energy guzzling stages that need huge infrastructure are one of the main reasons for the unviability of modern textile technology. And of course, the reason why this industrial revolution yarn technology is unsuited to Indian conditions is that it is uniform. It needs one kind of cotton and one kind of cotton only. With this way of making yarn, India loses what could be its greatest advantage of being able to grow different kinds of cotton in different regions. We need flexible yarn making technology that can adapt to different varieties of cotton. Then you will get a variety of product, which of course in the market, you know, brand building is a very important thing and people spend millions of dollars to build a name and we are throwing it away. Yarn making specifically suited to Indian diversity of cotton varieties is the missing link in our otherwise potential green, low energy, cotton to cloth production chain. If we had that, we could regenerate our diversity of cotton varieties, most of which we have lost. We still have the flexible technology of the handloom, and if we were able to match it up with diversity of cottons through adaptable, flexible spinning, what would we get? A unique, hard-to-beat cotton textile industry. It's only the middle stage that's missing. I suggest we rid ourselves of a past, to quote Nathaniel Hawthorne, a past that lies upon the present like a giant's dead body, the burden of a rigid, inflexible, 
energy-intensive yarn-spinning technology. But anyway, we have all these mills, and how are they doing? Actually, very badly. Today, the mechanized textile industry of India is mostly composed of spinning. Uh, weaving in mills is something <coughs> under 4%. Most of it is power, and handlooms actually still produce uh, 11 to 12 percent, perhaps even 13 percent of the cloth woven in India today. The spinning industry is on financial life support from banks. It has gargantuan bad debts. Uh, Sam has already told you it's almost two lakh crores. You know, so if we think Kingfisher Airlines debts are terrible at 7,000 crores, here's this industry which has almost two lakh crores of bad debts. Eight percent of the non-performing uh, uh, advanced uh, non-performing assets of the banks, the NPAs of the banks, are to the textile industry. But it's strange, we don't hear these dire facts about the mainstream industry, while we are constantly being told how the handlooms are in such bad shape. It's not the handloom industry that has these huge debts. The fact is that the textile technology that today is considered modern, both yarn spinning and mechanical weaving, is viable only through debt financing and on the back of an exploited workforce. A kind of exploitation in which we can't compete with China. And because the spinning industry is on life support, it's attracting vulture investors. What are vulture investors? Vulture investors look for dead and dying industry. As the New York Times reports after the 2008 Wall Street crash, there are a lot of dead carcasses on the road and the vultures are out sniffing. They're here already. A recent headline in the Economic Times says that the US's W.L. Ross plans to invest in the Indian textile sector. Has anybody heard of Wilbur L. Ross? He is known in the, in the US as the Dean of Vulture Investors. And now this canny investor has already taken the first steps towards swallowing up the Indian textile industry. And uh, let's not, I mean, you know, this uh, headline says, US's W.L. Ross Taylor's plan to invest in the textile sector. It sounds wonderful. It sounds like, you know, this large-hearted investor is pouring money into the textile sector. But he is actually, as he's as well known, you can, you can look him up on Wikipedia, and I won't go into the details of his career, Obviously, he's doing it for his own profit. And he's already bought OCM. And he's turned it into a profitable industry. And how has he done that? By making it a distribution industry. He's importing Italian silk squares and Italian ties and distributing it in the huge Indian market. And I have a feeling that the reason he's interested in the Indian textile industry is that he is going to shift the manufacturer to places who can do that exploitation better than we can. Places like China and Vietnam. And then he's going to bring in the yarn and sell it in our markets. And then that will be the end of the handloom, which needs hank yarn. And the uh, Indian spinning mills today are mandated by the government to provide at least 40% of yarn in hank form for handloom weaving. They don't, but we still get some hang yarn. But uh, I don't think it's part of uh, W.L. Ross's, Ross's agenda to provide yarn for hand from weaving. So it might be the second coming of the destruction of the Indian spinning industry. So this is how I feel that for this reason also, it's very important to develop small scale spinning because this is the only kind of industry that can stand up to Wilbur L. Ross and his ilk. Dispersed industry, small infrastructure, small investments, there's no way he can swallow up thousands of little mills scattered all over the place. This is a plea to the country's scientists and technologists who we know are capable of great things. It's a plea to them to put in the research and development needed to work out small-scale cotton yarn making for the future specifically suited to Indian cottons and to the handle, smaller, flexible machinery that can be run by alternative energy and that can process different cotton varieties. We could then take the cotton textile industry out of ghettos and industrial center, centers where it is today 
and put the whole field to fabric production chain in thousands of locations next to cotton fields, cutting out the exploitation of power loom workers, saving energy by cutting out transport, cutting out bailing, with smaller investments in small scale infrastructure, an industry that can be owned by producer collectives, a truly modern democratic textile industry on a vast scale, suited to an energy stressed future that would bring smiles and not tears to cotton farmers and weavers whose combined numbers make up a substantial part of the Indian population. And finally, handlooms and climate change. A recent report of the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate Change, which has members from the World Bank, Bank of England, Unilever, says that investments in low carbon technologies will stimulate rather than hamper economic growth. That makes India several steps ahead on this score. We don't even need to invest vast sums. We already have a low carbon weaving technology in all parts of the country, complete with its huge bank of equipment and skills. This means that we can have our cake and eat it too and share it around. But promoting hand weaving, we can claim international credit for setting up a low carbon textile industry. We can make good cotton cloth for ourselves and for export and spread the profits of textile making amongst a large part of our population. Weavers and farmers must be reconnected through small-scale spinning, not by harking back to the past, but in a modern, viable, feasible way, building producer-owned, flexible technologies around the handloom, rather than trying to replace it. The handlooms are there, the weavers are there, the cotton farmers are there, waiting to be offered an honorable life in return for providing us energy-efficient cotton textile production. As a postscript, I'd like to add that the Malka Initiative, in which I have been involved for some years, has taken the first small steps in this direction, so far, successfully. Thank you. There's lots of hands which are going up, and of course we have a discussion. Uh, I just would like to compliment Pazrama for laying out an extremely comprehensive canvas. Uh, ecology, economy, <coughs> the social aspects of it, the technical aspects of it. And actually it's a very brilliant weave of many threads which are coming together. Uh, I would only like to remind you that it's not only cloth. It's not just what we wear. It's what we eat, what we drink, how we live. How we travel. Every one of these has similar stories behind it. Uh, we are very fortunate that Rosrama is here to reveal one part of that story. But more such stories need to be revealed. And uh, perhaps now we'll have an interesting discussion about what parts can be brought further into this week. Yes? Rosrama, I was wondering why did you share with us your own experiences in this uh, Run a 
industry. Uh, if small people, small pockets, in maintaining their own uh, work, what they do, just like the way uh, our home cooking is being affected by the people who are supplying food these days, uh, including the pizza and everything else, uh, that is destroying the culture at home as well. So if we do not, or if we forget to look at the environment which is affecting us, which is a very important part of any business, whether you are at home or whether you are making clothes or writing software, anything. Uh, big companies buy out small companies. Not that they want that technology, but because they want to buy the competition and then kill it so that they can keep selling their own products. So <coughs> in any industry, if the person, <coughs> people running it, forget the overall environment of business, then it's going to be solved. So what is the protection, not just for this, but for any other uh, any, any uh, industry? So that, that's what has to be looked at. I don't think I'm qualified to answer that. <laughs> we, we, 
Why bring in machines rather than just importing the handloom or asking the British, enforcing that Indians don't use the handloom and only the British can use the handloom? Why did they choose to go the machinized way? This, uh, you know, I would like the person who's an expert in post-colonial theory to answer that. Um, you know, the answer uh, for that is, of course, that you know the people who were domin dominating society at that time who were dominating the direction of technology were from uh, the trader class or the merchant class. And so they were able to impose the mechanized textile weaving and make profits for their own kind of people, rather than hand weaving, which would you know, uh, be a distribution of the returns amongst uh, you know, uh, the actual producers themselves. Um, can I just also, uh, actually I have an apology to make, I was late because I came from, uh, there's a Kashputi colony in Delhi. I hope you have, some of you may have heard of it. It's a colony of profiteers. They occupy five acres of, five hectares of land, which has suddenly become very precious because the metro is passing by. And the Rahijas have taken it. Sorry? And the Rahijas have taken it. And uh, it is being sold for six crores. Only. Only. To the Rahijas who are going to build a 46 story, just displacing 3,500 families, who are essentially are now looked as very quaint remnants of an ancient age. You know? So this is the story. And it's the story of profits. It's the story of money making. It's got nothing to do with people's lives. So that is a, you know something that when you say why don't they listen? This is a question that forces us to ask all the time, why aren't they listening? The force are there. The people are still they don't listen. And there was a very uh, interesting uh, poster which was brought out by Oxfam in the early 80s. And it said, here are the engineers who can help us fly faster than sound. This was just when this new aeroplane had come. But where are the engineers? who will help us to live on the ground. You know? And this is a dilemma. That what are we being taught? What kind of society are we attempting to build? And what are the visions and the images we have for society? I have to end with another apology. I have to run off for another meeting. That's in Himachal Pradesh. I have a train to catch. I do hope you will excuse me, but um, you will take over the chair. And please continue this discussion. Thank you very much, Rosanna, for this very splendid uh, presentation. And I hope all of you will take it forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Donna. surviving, uh, like we have uh, in Srikakulam district in uh, Andhra Pradesh, we have something called hill cotton, and uh, something just across the border in Purissa, which is called uh, Panasa, and then there's a colored cotton, uh, which is grown uh, in the Gola area. So those survivals uh, we can still find, but I don't know of, uh, you know, what all the other varieties were that we have lost. 
I think the Dhaka cotton is lost. Uh, it was grown uh, on the banks of the river Mehna uh, in Dhaka. Uh, and uh, I think that's lost. Uh, but this, uh, what we grow in Srikakulam is sort of a version of that. That kind of, you know, very fine, produces very fine yarn. I don't think there's much information, but we need to know. I tried, you know, the, uh, in Edinburgh with the uh, botanical gardens there, but they lost their cotton collection. Are we talking hundreds or thousands? <coughs> thousands of grams? I, I would say hundreds, uh, because in each region uh, there were, you know, I think one variety predominated because cotton mutates very fast. So I don't think you would have had a mixture of varieties in a region. I think perhaps a region had one, but that's just a guess. sponsored cotton research are actually doing some research on desi cottons, uh, which they started, restarted about 10 to 12 years ago. Um, I don't know if they are doing things like the mapping. I'm not really familiar with the uh, situation as it is today, but it definitely needs to be done. So uh, it's one of the policy uh, hopes that uh, should be taken up. Uh, as for the role of designers, uh, I think the whole subject of design in crafts, in handlooms, is a very vexed question. And people have to be aware of uh, the continuity as well as uh, encourage the innovation rather than you know, thinking that it's the role only of the outside, the designer who comes in as an outsider. developed by the Deccan Development Society, where they had something to counter the public distribution system of the wheat, which was imported into India against the very scarce foreign reserve which we had in the 60s and given to the US government. And that is how the US embassy, etc., was built with that fund, because we didn't have the money to pay. So it was in rupees which was invested in India. And one of the things which really happened to counter the, as a result was that all the cereals disappeared. And, uh, what it, they, and you would be aware of the major reason or the flag project which the government of India signed the biodiversity uh, program was based on this bullock cart mela which is an annual mela which travels from one village to the other. Uh, it's an exhibition, it's a traveling exhibition, it's a rural traveling exhibition on the cereals, which happens every year. And uh, it's not just the isolation of a crop, but an entire lifestyle of songs, of music, of the practices connected with the sowing and all the rituals which go with it. So when she was talking about the mapping, um, there's a huge factor about the intangible heritage which is associated with the agricultural heritage and so on and so forth. And uh, it's 
it's a whole system of life and what she was talking about the decentralization gets all connected because you are uh, in this whole model of the smart city there's the presence of the local with the global which is balanced. So I was just thinking if we can all think of ways not only uh, the story of the puppeteers is as sad, sorry, because I'm advocating for them and it's it's terrible. It's really bad. I mean, just housing the Madaris in a 46 apartment building, it's 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 terrible. It was for 600 crores that land has gone. And, they, this, the, and everybody's got it. Yeah, I think um, one of the uh, ways of developing, of regenerating the desi varieties is to make sure that we have the technology that can use them. There's no point in farmers growing the desi varieties if they can't be spun. So our uh, effort really is trying to develop that technology. We are very far from it. We're actually, in Malka, we're still using second-hand uh, existing technology. But it is small scale. And this is what needs to be done. We don't have the resources to go into that kind of technology development. But that is what will need to be done in order to promote uh, the revival of the Desi Red. put together you giving us uh, a you a personal conviction on how to start business. Regarding see honestly it's the it's a sort of one way to look at it is a very steep climb. See if you want to reverse history, historical wrongs and in a today's world of uh, you can't deal with the politician, you can't deal with the industry guys, uh, so many people have to fight. But the basics and foundation is so strong in what you're saying. But uh, so let me ask, are you, uh, what is your take? Are you an optimist uh, in the whole game? Well, I don't know what you would call uh, a process that uh, has started that direction, um, which has got as far as selling the cloth, and the cloth has been very successful in the market. Uh, it is against the general trend. But, um, uh, you know, one starts and one works at it. I don't think it's a question so much of optimism and pessimism, but seeing how far it can go.